Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining me and my very special guest. You know her from such musicals as The Will Rogers Follies, How to Succeed in Business, Chicago, Jekyll and Hyde, The Cape Man, and most recently from the critically acclaimed new musical, Girl from the North Country. And this coming Friday night, November 20th at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, she kicks off her brand new concert that will stream here at Broadway World to coincide with her sensational new album, Triangle. Please say hello to my dear friend, Luba Mason. Yay! <laughs> oh my gosh, that clip was so exciting. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, get, a, I get a kick out of watching it. <laughs> well, that's good. First of all, Luba, how are you and where are you? I am doing great. I am in New York City in my apartment. I, I never went anywhere once this COVID thing started. I just stayed put here and I'm I'm grateful that I have some space and and where I live. So it's I've been very comfortable. And I have to say, I, I just I just found out I have antibodies for COVID. <laughs> so I, I don't feel as vulnerable when I go out there. It's always nice to have that little extra something of saying, oh my gosh, I got antibodies. Yes, I know. Ab absolutely. Yeah, I, I had the, the virus early, early on, very, very in, in March, actually. So, um, oh, so I'm glad they're still, still happening. So you had it early on. Yeah, I did. I did. I had it, you know, we closed, Broadway shut down. I think it was March 12th. Yep. March 15th, Sunday, I woke up with all those symptoms and it was like, uh oh, here we go. And um, fortunately, it wasn't really that bad. I mean, I wasn't in the hospital. There was no ventilator involved, et cetera. So um, it was just a really nasty, bad, bad flu. And I was just tired for like a month. But, you know, um, I'm actually I'm kind of glad I had it because now I feel more you know I, I have more resistance here so you know it's so interesting because it this virus has hit people in so many different ways i've had um, so many people on here from all these different shows who some got it early on some got it later some got it really really bad others got it for like you know a week or two but then oh, no. had yeah. fatigue for a month or whatever it's so yeah, different I how it affects to. people yeah, and I and I you know starting off the show with a real happy note. I um uh, <laughs> no, and I even I lost my mom just to get the, you know uh, I lost my mom in April too. So she, sorry, yeah. Yeah, she was one of the casualties of the nursing homes, you know, oh. people nursing homes. So, in any case, um, you know, God bless her. She went quickly in her sleep, and so it wasn't like long and drawn out. But in any case, you know, yes, COVID. We all have stories of COVID. It's it's affected everybody in every which way. Yeah. So I was going to ask you, how have you and your husband with like handling it and dealing as it's going on this this whole shutdown and everything? You know, it's so funny because um, you know my husband travels a lot you know, at least half the year. And I thought, uh oh, we're gonna be together now 24 seven. Is this divorce time? <laughs> That's the first thing I thought. I thought we haven't spent this much time together in I don't know how long, you know, we'll be seeing each other around the clock. And, you know, 
it, it just brought us closer together. I mean, it was just kind of like when we first met, you know, it was like, oh, you know, we were just hanging out, doing, you know, everyday things together and having the luxury of time together. And, um, and we just got into this routine. It was really cool, you know, so we've been great. I mean, you know, and, and now, also, fortunately, I mean, he's he's got he does a TV series, uh, Fear the Walking Dead. So he just left for work. He just left for Austin, Texas. Now, tell everybody who your husband is. Oh, uh, he's uh, Ruben Blades, and um, he's an actor and a musician, and he's he's quite the iconic uh, Latin oh, yeah. Latin in the Latin community. He's a, a big salsa salsa singer and and musician. So, um, and he's in politics as well. I mean, he kind of has his fingers in everything. But it's funny when I first met him, I I didn't even know he was a singer, and that was like a big part of. I mean, that, I mean the man. That's what he did his pretty much his entire life. And um, I just saw, knew him as an actor. And I, I used to think, um, you know, when I, I met him in rehearsals for The Cape Man. Paul yeah. Simon's The Cape Man. And I remember hearing him sing and I went, oh, he sings pretty good for an actor. <laughs> you know, I, and, and the cast is entirely Latin, you know, except for me, the gringa that I am, you know. Anyway, but uh, yeah. So I was going to ask you, you have this, such an incredible career. How life-changing was Paul Simon's musical, The Cape Man, for you? Obviously, you met your husband there. But you know, it, it was pivotal. It was really pivotal for me um, in many ways. Um, not only did I meet Ruben there, my husband, my future husband, but I was exposed to Latin music for the first time, even though Paul wrote it. I mean, Paul is pretty authentic when he yeah. writes. He does his research. So, I mean, the entire band, a lot of the band was Latin. I mean, um, the cast was Latin. Um, you know, I'm hooked, I'm, you know, I, I meet my husband, we're listening to Latin music. So, um, and Paul was such an, I, you know, he's such an icon and he was like one of my biggest, I was one of his biggest, he was one of my biggest fans. I was one of his biggest fans. And to be doing a musical with this pop, Oh Lord! Oh, it's a speaking of. That's my husband. Oh, fabulous! Um, you can tell him you're doing you're doing a live interview with Richard Ridge. You can. Uh, no, I gotta <laughs> decline. Richie, I got I got uh, your first here. Fabulous! I'll get him later. It. I'll get him later. Um, he knew we were talking about him, probably. You know, that, that, that's not funny. That could happen. Um, but anyway, I mean, just that, just this pop icon of Paul Simon writing Latin music and being immersed in that world. Um, it was just eye opening for me musically as well as personally. Uh, and, and as a result, the, the four albums that I've recorded, I have a lot of Latin influences in, in, in a lot of the songs. So, and I love, I love Brazilian music in particular. I mean, that's uh, a real, um, pocket that I really love. So anyway, it was it was quite um, a revelation that that musical. It really was. It really was. You know, I want to go into the musical you're doing now, of course, Girl from the North Country. Oh. I've had some of the cast on early on. Um, are you all staying in touch? I mean, everybody thought on March 12th that maybe it'd be two weeks or maybe three weeks or whatever. Like, how are you all staying connected? What are you missing the most of not doing the show? You know, we, we do, we stay in touch. We have our girl, I have a, my girl from the North country thread and you know, whenever ever anybody has a birthday, we're all on there. Happy birthday. What are you doing? Or if somebody has projects that they're, they're in the midst of, they post it. Um, so we, yes, we are in touch. And I have to say Mayor Winningham, who's, who's also in the show, she had, um, a nice like summer gathering for us at her country home in, in Connecticut. And so it was outdoors. It was, you know, I think it was like uh, early August. So the, the virus numbers were down and, and unfortunately a, a good half of our cast had the, had the virus. So we all were like, you know, about half of us met at her house. So that was a really great little reunion that we had there. Um, you know, I miss, it's funny, I just posted um, 
a backstage uh, photo of of the gals in my dressing room. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, my heart just kind of was was reaching out. I, I miss places. I miss I miss the routine of of you know going to the the, the theater every day and um, you know just just doing the ritual, just doing the yeah. ritual. And and you know it's been a long time since since I've been on Broadway. So when Girl finally got there, when we finally got a theater, it was. Oh God! It was it was just so lovely to be back in that space again and that routine and and especially since we 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 were a, a, a hit. I mean, you know, we had good reviews, so we thought, you know, we're we're going to get a good run here. We thought, and um, you know, so I miss I miss that and the camaraderie of of you know every day seeing these these folks. It's your family, you know, yeah. it's your family. Oh, I would have loved to have seen a picture from this outdoor gathering of everybody with different kind of masks on and social gather a yeah. social gathering all spread out. Hi down there. How how are you down there in that area? <laughs> yeah, well that's what I, and she had like this little pond. She had this yeah. pond at, behind her house. And so people were swimming in the pond, you know, people were it, it was a I don't know, I don't know how many acres yeah. they have, but several, you know, wow. it was beautiful. It was just lovely and it was the perfect setting. I would say a perfect way to have a socially distanced gathering. Like we have a lot of property, come on up. Yes, absolutely. And yeah, so it was great. What is it like living in the world of Bob Dylan and Connor McPherson? I mean, the combination of the two of them, I mean, Girl from the North Country, I, you know, growing up, I was brought up on cast albums. I think I told you this story before. Bob Dylan was not in my wheelhouse. And I was like, okay, I fell in love with this musical and the way his songs blended into this musical. What's it been like for you? I, I'm very much in the same boat as you, Rich, because I he was not in my wheelhouse either. And I, I remember there was a New York Times article where they asked us all about, you know, Bob and when yeah. was our first experience. And mine, you know, mine was like, I. I wasn't really a huge fan of his. And it's not because I didn't like him. It just wasn't what I listened to. Um, so this show, I mean, to be in this show with Bob Dylan music was like a real discovery for me. It was like, oh, so this is what all the fuss is about Bob Dylan, you know? Um, because I, you know, being a singer, uh, you know, singers, tend to focus more on your voice, on the voice of, of a songwriter and, and of a of, you know, a pop star or, or a folk singer. Um, and Bob was not known for his, really, his voice. I mean, it was his lyrics. He's a poet. And, um, and it's interesting when you're younger, I, 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 you know, I, I didn't really listen to lyrics so much. It was all about the voice and just the feeling that the song gave me. So yes, it, this this was a real discovery for me with uh, Bob Dylan and his music, and Connor. Um, you know, we had uh, I, I, we had the luxury of having uh, the author of the show be our director, and that is a real plus because what Connor did, even though we were maybe I think the third or fourth cast doing this show because it had originated in London. And then there was a cast, I believe, in Canada. He, he, we had the luxury of changing lines on the spot. He really fine-tuned the script to the cast that he had in front of him. Yeah. So, uh, you know, as he worked with us, and, and we also had the luxury of being downtown first at the public. Um, so by the time we got to Broadway, it was pretty much the same cast intact um, that he already knew us. He knew how we performed. He knew how we worked. He started to see, you know, our 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 um, you know our fortes, what we were better at, and what what he could kind of pull out and draw out. Um, and he he just was like almost like a, a puppet master, like kind of balancing everybody because it's a real ensemble piece. It's not a star vehicle in any any form, and so he really kind of balanced everyone out, I think, and gave ev everyone kind of has their spotlight in this show uh, that they're featured. So, um, 
And you get to play the drums. Oh my God, that was nerve wracking. <laughs> And it's still nerve wracking. I mean, I, I, you know, people are like, are you practicing your drums these days? I'm like, nope, <laughs> nope. I, I, you know, well, you know, once we we know we're getting back to Broadway, no. I'll, I'll pick it back up again. But um, it came pretty naturally to me. I, I had never played before, and I have to say, in my audition. Um, you know, after I did all my scenes and, and the singing, you know, Connor just said to me, okay, great, great, Luba, okay. Well, you know, this character, Mrs. Burke, we would really, um, we really want her to play the drums in the show. Um, you know, do you play any instruments? And I said, well, I play piano, clarinet, guitar. And he says, well, how do you feel about, you know, learning possibly the drums for this role? And I said, oh, I'll be fine, you know. And I walked out of the aud audition and I was like, oh my God. I have to learn how to play the drums if I get this. And um, um, I was really nervous about it. And I have to say, every time I walk out on stage for my song that I have to sing and play the drums, which is Sweetheart Like You, my heart is really beating fast. It's, it's you know, it's one thing to just play the drums. It's another to sing yeah. And play the drum. It's 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 doing this kind of a thing. It's um because you're singing kind of in and especially Dylan, um you know it's these are lyrics that you got to make sense out of. Um, it's not like I'm singing oh I love you I love you you know it's not um mundane. It's uh, Bob Dylan lyrics and and you're you're singing in a different rhythm than you're playing and it's um. You but, make it seem effortless because I've seen you. it a few times downtown. I've seen it a few times uptown. I said to myself, boy, I've got to ask her. She's good on those drums. Oh, you know, and somebody even after the show at the public, they're like, wow, I really like your style of playing. Where are you? What gigs are you doing? What do you got lined up? And I'm like, no, nope. no, not going to happen. <laughs> you know, you know, I have to tell you, you've been so busy during this shutdown. Um, Congratulations on all the success of the album and a oh, big billboard you. review and everything else. Oh, I mean, yeah. the, the accolades are coming in. The album is Triangle. It is absolutely stunning. This is your fourth solo album. But we have to talk about your concert, too, which kicks yeah. off this Friday, November 20th at tomorrow. 9 p.m. Tomorrow <laughs> night at Broadway World. It'll stream. I mean, how excited are you, first, for the concert and for this album? Um, I'm over overly thrilled I re because I really did not know uh, what the reaction was going to be to this album. Um, I call it Triangle because it's only three people. It's voice, vibraphone, and bass. Wow. And I do bring in a percussionist for I think two or three of the songs. But the concept is really these three people. It's a real minimalistic approach to music and it's never been done before. It's never been recorded before. So I thought, well, maybe it's never been recorded before because people don't want to hear that. <laughs> um, but I had tried out this concept in, in New York. I had for about a year, I had put this trio together and we we did some gigs in town pre-COVID just to make sure, you know, does this work? Do people like this? How are they going to respond to this kind of a lineup? And that the reactions were, were po very positive. So I thought, okay, I'm going to do an album. And then it was like, okay, now you're putting it out in the world. Yeah. How are people really going to, how are reviewers going to respond to it? How is the jazz community, you know, the music community, who, who's, you know, you, you just never know. And the response has been overwhelmingly very positive. I mean, I've, I think I've gotten over 12 or 13 or 14 yeah. reviews and they've all been great and people are praising it. And um, so, yeah. And then it was like, okay, it's COVID. Now, how do I get people to hear it, you know, <laughs> other than buying an album? And luckily we videotaped, filmed this live performance that I did of the recording thinking I was going to be selling a DVD down the line. But, and cause we had recorded this in 2018. And um, 
So now I have this wonderful video of, of the live recording of the in front of a live audience. I invited about 60 people, wow. to Power Station Studios, which is where we recorded it, the legendary Power wow. Station. And um, so I went, oh, we could have an, a virtual online streaming concert here. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really, really excited about that tomorrow. Really, cool. I just love how you thought at the time to film a concert live where you recorded your album, everything yeah. you, but all your other albums too, everything is different. You always think outside of the box and it's like, wow, it was, it must've been so incredible. See, I thought you just, I thought you just filmed this. I love that you did this beforehand and you're filming this with friends of yours and fans. Mm -hmm. I mean, how fun was it filming it? It was nerve wracking. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it was fun, but nerve wracking because what you see and hear um, on this concert and on the album is what you get. There are no overdubs. It was live. It's not like we went back into the studio with the musicians and fixed this and tweaked that or any. It was what you see and hear is there. So it was kind of nerve wracking knowing that this is the album. And if you screwed up, you screwed up kind of a thing. Um, but it was also exciting to have the live audience there, I have to say, because they really boost the adrenaline uh, for your performance. And that was really exciting. And to do it at the power station, which is also where Bob Dylan had his sweet sweetheart like you, which is the song I do in the show. Um, that was great. And of course, I had these two um, pros behind me, uh, these musicians. I have Joe Locke on vibraphone. He's one of the top vibraphonists in the country. And uh, he's like toured with uh, Grover Washington Jr. And, and Diane Reeves and numerous other people. And then I also have James Genus on bass acoustic and electric bass. And um, he's a Saturday Night Live bass yep. player, as well as he's big, he tours a lot with Herbie Hancock and Chick Corea. And so these guys, I was just thrilled to have them behind me. And- um, That means your producer. Oh, and my producer. Oh, I can't forget him, Renato Neto. He was a, a collaborator and keyboardist with Prince for I think over 10 years, 12 years. So I had all these, I was just, you know, thrilled to have these, these guys surrounding me. And um, I knew I was in great hands. I, and, and just being game for the project because um, again, you know, you're, you're doing this project that's never been done before. And it's like, okay, Who's gonna do it? You know, who's gonna wanna like step into those shoes and and experiment with me? So that was all great, actually. It was. It just, yeah. It couldn't have turned out better. It yeah. just, yeah. This is your fourth solo album. You yes. have three others. What do you love the most about recording and the whole process of making albums? <sighs> I think the 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 the, the thing that I love most is when I sit down to just decide what I'm going to do next, what is the next album going to be? It's the, it's the research. It's, yeah. um, it's putting it together. It, you know, my second album, I wrote all the music for it. So <clears throat> that entailed uh, some collaboration of writing with someone or writing on my own. Um, and really, I always like to put something out there that it is is new or fresh. I don't, you know, as a matter of fact, when I approached this album, Triangle, uh, someone had recommended that I do a trio because my last album was like a six piece band. Yeah. And, and it was really challenging to find gigs that would pay that you know uh, or to make money out of that i or you know it was a hole in my pocket and so somebody yeah. suggested we'll do a trio and i said you know everybody does piano bass and drums i mean you know you pick some jazz standards everybody does that another jazz you know what what do i want to do so then then the vibraphone came in because i had a vibraphone in my last band um 
And that was new and different. And then just adding a bass. And, yeah. it, you know, it, it was, I had to hear it in my head at first. And then I thought, okay, this is really different. I think I really kind of like the sound. So when I, I think that's, one of the things that I really love about um, doing an album is 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 the discovery of yeah. what I'm, I want to put on it and do on it that might be new and fresh. Um, well, it is so cool. It's such a fabulous album. I thought to myself, boy, every all your albums are totally different. They're just so, this is such yeah, a cool are. album. Yeah, they really to have are. It this time. And, yeah, and 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 you know, people ask me, well, well, you're a jazz singer then, and I went. No, I'm not really a jazz singer. Well, how do you, how do you define yourself? I'm a vocalist. You know, I Love I'm it. classically trained. My older sister was an opera singer, so I I trained with her teachers from Manhattan School of Music and Juilliard. And uh, I'm from uh, I'm first generation Slovak American, so there was a lot of Slovak folk music in my house playing. Um, I listened to the pop radio. Uh, I love that. And then I just, you know, I discovered show tunes, you know, I started taking out the album from the library, you know, me now too. I'm dating myself. And, me know, too. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. And, you know, I took one out. I, I think it might've been cabaret was like the first one or Chicago. It was one of those. And as soon as I heard Cheetah Rivera singing and belting and Liza belting, I started belting along with them. And I was like, wow, this is great. So that's when musicals started. Yeah. To so yeah, I, I think, um, I, I think once you have a training in the classical field, you can really pretty much go anywhere you want to go. You you just have yeah. a great base of training. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what's kept my longevity on Broadway as well, because as you get older, you, you, you don't have the notes as much anymore, you know, your voice. But I, I, the training goes a long way, my friend, really yeah. does. Well, we're going to get into your career because you have this incredible, wonderful stage oh. career. But I want to offer you have some incredible packages, viewing packages you're offering your audience tomorrow night, which I, I think, again, so out of the box. And it's so affordable. You offer a premier ticket, which has the concert after party on demand for only $10. Yeah. Then you have a full access ticket for the concert and a triangle digital download. For yes. sixteen ninety nine, which okay. I love that too. I love the ninety nine. I used to buy my albums at Corvettes, and they were all like Broadway cast album four ninety nine. I love that. But you have the ninety nines. <laughs> then you have a full access concert and triangle CD for twenty four ninety nine. And then this is my. I love this one. The full access complete catalog, where you get a ticket to your show and all four of your CDs: Triangle, Nick's Toro, which I love that title, Crazy Love, and Collage. All four. Forty-one ninety-eight, not for forty-one ninety-nine, but forty-one ninety-eight. Is it forty-one or thirty-one? I think it's forty-one. But you're, oh, okay. everybody, I think is everybody just go to Broadway World Events or just Google in Luba Mason or Google in her show. You can get tickets for there. It's so incredible. I mean, what a great way to offer streaming packages to people that they can watch this. What's really great about this thing now? The one saving grace about the COVID whole thing is you have fans all around the world and all around the country that may not have been able to come to New York to watch you at a concert. They right. can all just buy a ticket and right. watch you, you know, on demand or tomorrow night, but anywhere in the world, that must make you feel so great. It really does because the ticket, yeah, it's an on-demand ticket. I mean, you yeah. can watch it for- Any time, for Any a whole time. month. I think it's a week. It's not a whole month. It oh, might I'm sorry, okay. It's a week, it's but like free. I said, everybody go there, but I'll keep buying a ticket because I want to watch you all month. Good. Oh, thank right. you. Thank now, you. Now, listen, I want to go into your career. Like I said, you have this fabulous career. I have known everything you've done on stage, but you've had like 10 different names. So it's so hard to find all yourself. Tell our audience when you first started on Broadway, what were some of your first names before you became Luba Mason superstar? I, um, <laughs> my, my, my maiden name is Gregus. So I started as Luba Gregus. That's where I started. Yeah. And then I did a show with Martin Sharnan, and he found out that my real name is Lubica, which is, uh, you know, Luba is like Bill for William. So Luba is for Lubica. So he, he loved that. And he says, you got got to use that name. 
So I then I became Lubica Gregis. Uh, and then I did a show with Tommy Toon, yeah. and he started calling me Lubaitza. Lubaitza, Lubaitza, Gregus, Lubaitza. <laughs> and I went, no, that's not how you say my name. <laughs> so then I started spelling it phonetically, you know, and then that was there was a different spelling yeah. change. So he would say it maybe more correctly, but that didn't really work. So then I went back to Luba Gregus, you know. And then... <laughs> This is, this is the one out of the box. <laughs> then um, someone had suggested um, that I change my name entirely because I, um, I had gained some weight. This was, I'd gotten, you know, like it was several years out of college. <laughs> so somebody, somebody says, you know, if you change your name, you're gonna change your perspective on yourself. You're gonna lose weight. I changed it to Kim Freshwater. <laughs> And that's my email, actually. So then I went to Kim, and people were like, what? Kim Freshwater, okay. And I made everybody call me that, and everybody did. It was really kind of cool. So I was Kim Freshwater for like three years. The only people who wouldn't call me that is my mother. Yeah. My mother, and I think it was my boyfriend at the time. Um, then, you know, I just kind of had it with the Kim Freshwater. I went back to Luba Gregus. And then I got married, first time. Yeah. <laughs> First marriage to Ken Mason. Yeah. And I went, hmm, that kind of sounds good. Luba Mason. I like that. So then I went to Luba Mason. I just love that you have all these names. So I want to start, you know, Broadway debuts are really special. Yours was in late night comic, right? Yes, it was. That was okay. my first. We opened Thursday night, closed Sunday afternoon, four days. Now you were billed for three different characters. You remember the characters you played in that? No. Hooker, club <laughs> owner, ensemble. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, yeah, nightclub owner. Yeah, that I that one I knew. I wasn't I didn't know I was billed as a hooker. But I it must have been really <laughs> great to sort of be like, oh, I have three different things I build at in this show. Yeah. I was featured as a nightclub owner, actually. Yeah, yeah. Right. What do you remember about I mean it was Broadway? I know it didn't last long, but how thrilling was like your opening your Broadway debut in that? You know, Rich, that that was huge for me. Yeah. yeah. I, I, and I have to say, the most vivid memory I have of that show is after the show, my parents were came backstage. My father in his tuxedo, yeah. my mother in her blue sparkling gown with her mink stole, and my father grabbing me by the shoulders and just going, you did it, you did it, you're on Broadway, you're on Broadway, I'm so proud of you. Because that was my dream. That was my dream since I was in fifth grade. And you know, being immigrants, I mean, they, they were immigrants, it was like, oh, that's so sweet, our little girl wants to be on Broadway, you know. And I did it, and it was like so validating. And I was just so proud, and my father had tears in his eyes, that's what I remember. It was exciting as hell, man. It really. Oh, I was. love it. I love it. And then, of course, you mentioned Tommy too. You did the Will Rogers Follies. Yeah. Like one, 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 one of those names you had. I mean, how exciting was it? Were you like Zigfeld's favorite, like second to the left or something? I forget what I, I was the second girl from the right as a, one of the Zigfeld Folly girls, and I was the first understudy for Zigfeld's favorite. Um, originally that was Katie Huffman and I was her understudy and I was second understudy for the Betty Blake role, the leading lady for D. Hody. And I got to go, I mean, I, I went on as Zigfield's favorite many times, but, and I did eventually get to go on as Betty Blake with Mac Davis when Mac Davis was on. So that show really gave me my wings in, in the business. And I think that, you know, kind of, that was a huge hit, Will Rogers. So that kind of put things on the board for me. It was like, oh, she's in a hit show and she did these roles. And that's when people start to kind of take notice. Oh, I love that. Did you also do Sid Caesar's show too? I did. That was right before that. Yeah. Unfortunately, that was not, uh, uh, yeah. it didn't do as well. But I worked with legendary God, Sid Caesar, hello. I mean, a lot of the kids today probably don't even know who he is, but this is a legend and yeah. uh, his show of shows was, was huge. It was exciting.
really exciting. I, I can imagine, like you said, you get to get, get a gig with Sid Caesar. I love that show. I know it didn't last long, but listen, to see an icon like him on stage and to see all of you. And you oh, had, a, you had another name in that too. I think you had no, another one of your names in that. That was Lu, Lu, yeah, that was Lubica, that one, L-U-B-I-C-A, yeah. I have to pull all my playbills out. Yeah, I, 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 and you know, I have all my, the, 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 uh, the Broadway cards. What do they yeah. call the place? Window cards, cards. <laughs> window cards. I have them in, in my gym upstairs, and it's so funny seeing my name different like in every show. <laughs> but then, of course, there was Hedy LaRue in the first Broadway revival, mm -hmm. which is behind me over there. Yeah, you co-starred opposite Matthew Broderick. I mean, Hedy Larue. I mean, that's when I really got to know you because I remember we were at the recording session that day because it was recorded on April second, which was my birthday, and Matthew let me sit right in front of the microphone when he sang "I Believe in You." I had the fondest time at that recording session when you all recorded on oh. RCA. But you got to do Hedy Larue. How incredible and how fun was that show to do in that role? Uh, it was amazing, and yes, you're absolutely right. That was the show that really put me out in the Broadway oh, yeah. community. That's that's when people really kind of went, oh, who's this girl, you know? Um, that cast had Matthew Broderick in it, Megan Mullally, um, Vicki Clark, uh, Lilius White. I mean, this cast was just amazing, really was. And then Sarah Jessica Parker came in oh, and yeah. did it for a little while. We had John Stamos come in for a little while. Um, this was like my big coming out role and she was so much fun to play. She, you know, just, and, and she's this girl from Queens, which I am. <laughs> um, you know, I, I got to draw upon a lot of, you know, I, just the accent, everything. I mean, um, and the costumes I got to wear. I got to be like eight feet tall in this show. I had like five inch heels, I had the wig, and then I had this big hat, you know, you couldn't miss me in the show. It was it was just a dream role, really a dream role. But that was such a monster hit. Like, of course, Will Rogers was too. But to have yeah. a, a role of your own, yes. I mean, you couldn't beg, yeah. borrow, or steal a seat to that show. And it was no. like everybody. I I used to go all the time to see you know Matthew and all of you, and then John Stamos. I mean, and Sarah. But it was just wonderful to go to the Forty Sixth yeah. Street Theater. That that was one of my favorite theaters before it changed its name. But I mean, it was just this runaway hit. It must have been so great every night to watch. Like Lilius would do Brotherhood of Man, and the place would just go ballistic. Crazy. I mean, she like stopped the show. I mean, she just kind of starts wailing and. Yeah. It was, she had the 11 o'clock number basically, you know, it was really, and it was the first time that Matthew was singing in a show. When he so. came down on that scaffolding, the place went ballistic. Yeah, because yeah. it was like, oh my God. And he has this lovely voice. Yeah. It's, it's So people were like, whoa, we're in for a great ride here, you know? So yeah. um, it was a great. But, you know, then you mentioned Cheetah Rivera taking albums out of a library. You got to play Velma Kelly. Oh, I mean, what was it like stepping into those shoes in the hit revival of Chicago? Um, you know, I have to tell you this really quick story because um, growing up, the second Broadway show I ever saw was Dancing. And I saw Anne Ranking in it. And when I saw her, you know, like wrap her body around this pole with those long legs that she had and that long hair, I sat there, I think I was in the sixth grade. I went, that's what I want to do when I grow up. I mean, I was mesmerized by this woman on stage and I just followed her career from there on. So when I got into Chicago, I have a put in with Ann Ranking. So I came full circle. That day was so, I mean, like one of the best days of my life. I mean, they said, "Oh, Anne is coming by, and she's gonna she's gonna coach you, and then we're gonna do a dress rehearsal, and we're putting you in the show." I was like, "Oh my God!" You know, and just to see her, to talk with her, for her to give me notes, to for her to tell me, you know, wonderful compliment. It was, you know. Oh God, you know, it's just, these are, this is somebody you looked up to. And, and as I said, I, I put this in one of my cabaret shows. I said, you know, now when, when, you know, you, 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 you finish a show, you go outside and you've got all these fans wanting your autograph and they tell you that, 
you know, you have just made their day, you know, that they want to be like you, they look up to you. You know, I went, oh, I get it. I really get it now when, you know, young people are watching your performance on stage and how much it means to them. It, could, it means everything to them. Yeah. Well, you were one of my favorite Velmas. Cheetah's my favorite. You're, one of, you're right up there. I, I love okay. you in that. But I didn't realize that you had to put in. I love Anne Ryan King. Annie, Annie, Annie did my show about two months ago, and it was the highlight. I mean, I just, I've always watched, we sat for an hour, and we went through a whole entire career. She is oh. one of the sweetest, and it was like, you know, because yeah. I saw her in everything. Oh. From, you know, from over oh. here to everything, you know. Oh, God, yes, yeah. But and she's also a sweetheart, besides being one of really? the most talented people, a real, real sweetheart. Yeah, I agree. You, you know, then you took over the role of Lucy from Linda Etter yeah. in Jekyll and Hyde. I mean, those were some big shoes to fill, but you were able to make her your own. And I love when people go into something and they're like, oh my God, Linda Etter's no longer in the show. Now Lubin Mason's in it, but you made her your own. Everybody's like, wow, because you blew me away in that too. What was it like living in that world of Frank Wildhorn and Jekyll and Hyde? I, I you know, I was, ex uh, two stories here. First of all, I couldn't get seen for this show because I had just finished Hetty LaRue, which was a comedic role. And I did the Cape Man, which yeah. didn't last very long. And that Cape Man was really the first time I had like some singing, some solo singing in it. And it wasn't a lot, it was a smaller role. So when I heard that Linda was leaving the show, I went, hmm, we're about the same height, the same type. I said, I know I can sing the shit out of these songs. I know that, but nobody else does. But I was like, you gotta get me an audition. You got to. My agents tried, the, they, he could not get me an audition. He came back saying that the casting director said they're looking for real singers for this show. So I'm sorry, Luba, we, they can't see you. And I went, <laughs> oh, you know, and you're, you're just thinking, I. I found out that the musical director of the show was someone I had done a workshop for maybe like two years prior. So I wrote him a note. His name is Jason Howland. Jason, yeah. if you're watching, thank you. I wrote him a note backstage. I said, I want to be seen for this show. I really feel I'm right for it. The next morning, my agent calls me and says, I got you an audition. I went, hmm. I bet it had something to do with that note I wrote. So anyway, I got the I got the audition and I sang from the show and and the other the other thing. So I get in there and now I have to prove myself. And I saw the show and there was I had so many other different ideas than what Linda did and um, I, I asked to have a, a meeting with the director before I was put in because I didn't want to show up first day of rehearsal and just start doing all these new different things. I wanted to get this approved by the director. Um, and also I knew putting me in was very pivotal for the show because they had been looking for a star to fill those shoes because Linda was such a huge hit with the show. The show was written for her by Frank and they really thought that the show was going to close after she left. So they were really, you know, when they finally hired me, it was kind of like, oh, we hope she works out kind of a thing. Anyway, long story short, had the meeting with the director. He loved all my ideas. I went into the show and people loved it. So, And the producers, I remember the producers coming backstage after like that first week and they were like Luba because they they had some longevity now attached to the show people you know were they had the Jackies you know the fan base the Jackies and if they didn't like you you know you know kind of a thing it's Broadway can be you know they people like their fans they like their people and if they don't like you Good luck. <laughs> no, because that was one of the first shows with had the Jackies. It had this very vocal yes. fan base who were obsessed with that show. Yes. I think it was yes. One of the first shows, I think, I'm sure there were other shows that named their fan base, but that was like so loyal to everybody connected to that show. But oh, yeah. they, so did you do it with all the with all the Jekylls? Were you with, with Cuccioli yes. and Bob? Did you, did yeah. you, did you, I, I started with Bob and then I did it um, with Rob Evan. Uh huh. And after that year, they wanted to do a whole new refresh cast list. So I did it with those two guys. 
you must have had the time of your life, the originals. I did. I, I you know, I, I was I was hoping I'd do it with with Robert, you know, with Bob, uh, because um, you know, he's the original. It's you know, I, I've been in shows where, you know, the cast starts to rotate, people leave, you know, other people come in, and the show starts changing. It's not what it used to be. Yeah. Um, it's not necessarily worse or any better, you know, sometimes it's better. Sometimes it, 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 the chemistry of a cast starts to really change. So um, it's always nice to, to do it for a little while anyway with the original people. But it must have been really fascinating to do it with both Bob Cuccioli and then Rob right. Evan, like to go between the two of them because they were a little different. They were, but you know, Rob Evan was the matinee Jekyll. Yeah. So even when I was doing it with Bob Cuccioli, I still was doing it also with Rob Evan. Uh, on the matinees, so um, so when Rob eventually took over for the role after Cuccioli left, um, it it wasn't new for me because I already knew, you know, the difference. And and it's great, it's great when you get a different cast member uh, again, like the chemistry changes and um, it's you you, you it, it it just kind of keeps you on your toes, really. Yeah, you know. I love how you went into this. First, they wouldn't see you, and then they saw you, and then were like, well, the show may close. We don't even know if she's going to be any good. We have actors of every age watching this from around the world. I'd love to ask about auditions and just, were you always good at auditioning? And how do you psych yourself up? How do you put those other voices behind you? Like when you're going up, it's like, I want this role in Jekyll and Hyde, but you know there are all these obstacles. How do you like get rid of the negativity and just go for it? Well, no, I I'm, I wasn't always good at auditions. Um, it's something that you just, I don't know, some people are great at auditions right off the bat and some, some people are not. It's something that took me a while and doing a lot of to gain the confidence. So the second you walk into a room, you are confidence personified. And that's what the people behind the desk want to see. They want to see somebody who knows what they're doing. They're confident and they're going to they're going to present the goods. They're going to give you the goods. Um, what was your question? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's totally. But like when you went in for Jekyll and Hyde, oh, knowing yeah. all these other yeah. obstacles of saying, you know, the show could close. I may not get good reviews. The Jackies may hate me. You know, how do you put that all behind you? <sighs> you know, you, it, it's with practice. You just have to shut those voices off in your head. Everybody has those voices in their head. Everyone does, whether you're a performer, whether, you know, you're, you're, you're a Time Warner, you know, a, a computer operator, you know, in every field, everybody's got voices in their head. I call it the inner bitch, you know, that's, that's just telling you the bad stuff, you know, don't do this, don't do that. Oh, I'm, you're nervous. Oh, you know, be scared. You got to just shut it off. And, um, and that takes sometimes time and sometimes not sometimes, you know, it's, and, and, and with practice and doing it over and over again, and with more credits to your name and more experience, it, it goes away. It goes away. And by, by this point for me, I mean, I've been in the business for right. over, over 25 years and, you know, I walk into auditions and, you know, they're either going to love me or they're not. And, and I have no control over what they think. All I have control over is what I do in there. Yeah. And I just make sure I do the best I can. And um, that's what you can do, really. Or you could change your name again. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, I'm just I'm kidding, though. No. no, but everybody says the same thing. You just go in there, you do the very best you can, let the door close, and you leave. Because you never know what they're actually looking no. for or whatever. You know, you just do what you can. And it's interesting because my sis uh, I have a niece who's who's yeah. going into the business now. And my sister sends me, you know, some of her videos, her submissions. Oh, you know, this role, and she gives me the description of the role. Well, this video that she's submitting doesn't necessarily show off this or this or and she really starts to nitpick at all these little nuances of, of the submission of the, her daughter's video. 
And I'm like, you know what? You're 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 stressing out on this. You're 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 just nitpicking too much. They're going to make a judgment and a decision on like the first five seconds of this video. Thank you for that. Yep. They may not even listen to this entire song she's singing or this entire scene she's doing. They're going to just look at her and go, no, I think we want an Asian girl for this. Or no, I think we want a girl with blonde hair with this. Or no, yeah, you can't, you just do the best you can. And you present and you try to be as true to yourself and be yourself as best as you can, you know. Yeah, beautifully put. Great words of advice. Thank you for that. Have you been doing self tapes at home during this pandemic? A lot. <laughs> you know, it's funny. You have such a beautiful background going on in your home now. I've had so many people on. I said, Richard, don't look to the left, don't look to the right. It's like Horderville. They're like, you know, could you turn your house into, you know, this like, this is what I could offer them. It's like, and then like Reed Carney said yesterday, when they want the full body shot, like, Richie, I live in this apartment. It pulls back. You see all my instruments. You see my oh, whole so house. Yeah, well, wait a minute. Here you go. <laughs> Here's the extent of my wardrobe. <laughs> It's only waist up, kids. That's all it is. That's all that counts. I got sweatpants and slippers on. But, but no, um, yeah, I'm lucky to, I, I kind of figured this out. This took a while, you know? I mean, yes, I have been doing a lot of, uh, you know, um, videos and, and uh, at home. And it took a while to finally get that ring light, you know, to find the lighting correctly, place the computer, get the right background, you know. Pain in the neck. I hate it, but I got it. I got to accept it. And this is the future. No, you've got it all dialed in. It's like we have nothing yeah. but time to, to perfect this stuff at home now. It's like, well, I'm not going out anywhere. So I might as well just sit here and play with the ring light and everything else. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. You know, my final one of my final questions for you is, you know, it's the business is going to be so different, like you said, for your niece. Oh, it's all good. Ruben's probably like his, his, he's still saying, Where is she? Where is she? I know, I know. You know it is it's so, again. <laughs> it's so interesting now with all these new kids that are trying to break into the business now. It's going to be a whole other world, you know, post pandemic, yeah. the way they're doing it now. And I mean, what advice would you offer? I'm sure you teach master classes and everything else. What advice would you give for the youngins starting out or trying to break their way in to the business now? I mean, how they should start a career. You know, it's so different now than how it was when I started out in the business. I think the kids today have a lot of advantages. I mean, the internet, period. You know, when a role comes up, that all they have to do is Google. Um, they've got all these um, virtual uh, reality shows now, The Voice, you know, American Idol, all those things where they get to see their competition. They get to see the bar that they have to, you know, be at. So, I mean, what's my advice to these kids? Um, I've, I've always given the advice to be able to train and do as much as you can in the business as far as be able to sing not only classical or legit, but belt and sing in different styles, to be able to dance, to study dance as well, to study acting, you know, not just musical theater pieces, but you know, the classics, um, to get the training under your belt. I've had a lot of classical training under my belt. I'm a classical pianist. I've been classically trained in voice, in dance, um, and even acting. I went to NYU, Circle in the Square. Get as much classical, solid base training as much as possible. Um, because once you have that, you can really go anywhere. And, um, you know, the, I think also the business is much more competitive today than it was when I entered. Um, and I, I, you know, it's, it's, don't be discouraged. You have to grow a thick skin. And if you don't get it on the first 20 tries, keep going. 
you know, eventually it's, it's going to hit. I mean, if you do everything right, if you train, you've got the talent, you've got some business savvy, you've got tech savvy now, um, you know, it'll happen. It's just a matter of time. It's a, it's a numbers game. It really is a numbers yeah. game. Beautifully put. My final question. Oh, totally. My final question is: What are you looking forward to the most about tomorrow night's concert, November twentieth, nine oh. p.m. Eastern Standard Time? You know, I'm looking because it's it's a pre-recorded um, presentation. I'm looking forward to the Q and A afterwards, um, where I am live. I will get to go live and answer questions, and hopefully, you know, meet and greet. It's called the meet and greet uh, Q and A. Yeah. It's just just to um, make that one-in-one -in -one connection with people that we're missing so much of today. That is great. What a great way to meet with everybody live tomorrow night after this. The clips I have seen from this concert, Luba, are beautiful. The new <laughs> album is stunning. Congratulations on all the reviews that keep coming in. Like I said, big billboard piece today. I mean, really, really wonderful, but. I also want to show you, I made LP. Oh. Oh, it still has the plastic on it, but these just arrived. There you go. Luba May. Look at yeah. you. All right. It's really so where can, It's a big picture. people go to your website? Where should they go? To the, how yeah. do they find the uh, where? Yes, they can go to my website. They can get the digital downloads there, the, the LPs, the CDs as well. So, um, yeah, I, I, I decided to do this because I just thought it was such a special project that I thought, oh, let me let me print up some LPs with this. Oh, I'm obsessed with the vinyl. All right. Yeah. You really did. It takes us back to when we went to the library and took out uh, albums. Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, I'll tell you. It's, oh, oh, I love it. The, the big ones. I Listen, I rebought everything in my house. I rebought everything I got rid of years ago on eBay. Unopened so I could open them all over again to play in my stereo. But I'm obsessed. Good for you for that. But like I said, you. congratulations on Thank everything. You. I have known you literally. You and I got to know each other during How to Succeed. I've loved your career, everything that's happened to you. And like I said, you are one of the first. Like I said, I just love what's happened to you. Everybody, tune in tomorrow night. Tickets are available at Broadway World Events. Just type in Luba Mason, type in Triangle. It's tomorrow night. It's then on demand. And everybody, until we see you again, stay safe, wear a mask, and we'll see you soon. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much, Richie. Really, thank you.